Welcome everybody to chapter number one, Matter, Measurement, and Problem Solving. In this lecture, we are going to be covering just the basis of what is chemistry, uh, different units that we're going to use, and, and, and how do we think like a scientist. One of the major goals that I would like you guys to leave this class with is that idea of how do I think like a scientist? What do I need to do to become a scientist? Many of you guys have already started thinking like one, and that's great. And so uh, we just want to kind of review what we mean by that. So before we get started, one of the things that we want to do is we want to just talk about what is chemistry? You know, I want you guys to think about it. Simple definition for chemistry. You know, chemistry is the science that seeks to understand the behavior of matter by studying the behavior of atoms and molecules. You know, chemistry, I like chemistry because it's the only science that says that you matter. It is. It's the only one that says you matter, uh, which is great. Uh, science is the study of atoms, right? Atoms are submicroscopic particles that are the fundamental building blocks of ordinary matter, right? And what we're going to see is that these atoms can be formed together to form different what are known as compounds or molecules. We see a molecule uh, on the slide here. We see an oxygen molecule, two hydrogens and one oxygen. We see that uh, the, this oxygen molecule is in red and the hydrogens are in white and, and we have one oxygen, two hydrogens, and, and that makes water, you know, a very safe thing for us to drink. On the bottom here, we have a hydrogen peroxide molecule, which has two oxygen atoms and two hydrogen atoms. So with the inclusion of just one extra oxygen, we now have made something that would be very toxic for us to drink. And so this is why studying atoms and, and how they form together to make compounds and, and, and different things like this is very important. Molecules are atoms that have bonded together in specific geometrical arrangements. We're going to talk about shapes of bonding uh, uh, of molecules and why that's very important. We're also going to talk about how atoms come together uh, to bond. And so not only do we, we're going to look at different atoms bonding to make a different molecule, we're going to see how the same atom can combine to have different behaviors. On the left, uh, as I'm looking at the screen, it's on the left, uh, we see graphite, right? Graphite is very cheap. Uh, we can put it in a pencil and we can use it to write, uh, take notes with. Uh, very cheap, you know, very easy to find at a Walmart. The one on the right is diamond. Diamond is very expensive, very hard, very tough uh, substance and, and very expensive, obviously. But they're both made out of pure carbon. They're both purely carbon. But what you can see is just that the arrangement of the atoms is different. And that is enough of a difference to say one is graphite and the other is diamond. So we're going to talk about chemistry. We're talking, we're going to talk about science, right? Because chemistry is a branch of science, right? Science is a big umbrella to under which biology and chemistry and physics and math and, and all that other stuff are put underneath there. All those other subjects are put underneath. And so science is performed in a very specific way. One of the things we're going to talk about is the scientific method. The scientific method is a, is a way of scientific thought. It is a step-by-step -step procedure on the way science is done. It began, if we want to think about it, the, the idea of, of doing an experiment, getting some data, testing another hypothesis, uh, began with a, a guy by the name of Antoine Lavoisier. We're going to come back to him, and we're going to see why and what he showed us and, and what he gave us and why he really is the father, if you will, of the scientific method. Uh, gaining of science, uh, of knowledge in science, what we know in science is empirical. It's what we see. It's what we do. It's what we experiment. These experiments have to be repeatable. What do you think an experiment being repeatable means? And what happens if you do an experiment and another lab does an experiment and it's not repeatable? What do you think that means? And these are just some of the things that we need to think about. These are some of the questions that we need to start thinking about. Like, I, I, And if we don't know, then ask. I'd love to talk to you about it, and I'm sure some of your fellow uh, classmates would as well. The foundation of modern science is observation, right? Much of what we study in science is based on what we observe in the natural world. You guys have done this, right? This is where I said you, most of you guys have probably thought, of, thought like a scientist before. Many of these observations that we see probably don't amount to anything, right? They're just passing observations, but there are some that really make us think. And, and the example that I use uh, is, you know, when we first, so I'm originally from Indiana. And when we first moved down here from, to Texas, I noticed that the crickets were really, really loud. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what makes the crickets in Texas louder 
than the crickets in Indiana. Now, did I take some crickets and, and study them out in the lab? No, no, I didn't. But that's where science starts, right? Antoine Lavoisier made the observation that the mass of his starting material, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about mass and weight, but very similar, but, but that the mass of his starting material equaled the mass of the object after he burned it. So he worked on combustion. Uh, I would like to work on combustion, you know, burning things. Um, but the observation was very important. Right, and and this started to make him think. Well, I I wonder why that would be, you know, where I have a mass of an object, and then I would burn something, and then I would get something else. So what are what are some of the things that you've wondered about? Right, that that's the question. Is what are some things that you've thought and wondered about? So observations, right? So so we have a series of observations. Observations lead to us formulating a scientific law or a scientific hypothesis. Now, a scientific law is just a brief statement that summarizes past observations and then is able to predict future ones, right? It's a series of consistent observations. Notice, repeatable. These observations are, you, you do not make a scientific law based on one single observation. And, it, and these describe how nature behaves, right? This is important. We, we, we need to start thinking about these laws and theories and, and the goal or the purpose of each of these, you know. Lavoisier, so he, he said, the mass of something that I burn is the same before I burn it and after I burn it. The mass is the same. And he saw this consistently over and over and over again. And so what he did was he came up with a law of conservation of mass, right? A law of conservation of mass is just in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed, right? So it's there. So if it's there at the beginning, it's there at the ending. When we talk about things in, at the end of chapter three, at the beginning of chapter four, when we talk about balancing chemical equations, you can thank Antoine Lavoisier for that because it's his fault. Uh, and so a scientific law is a brief statement. Now, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is, right, because usually these laws lead to hypotheses, is a tentative interpretation or explanation of the observations, right? So this is the first test or the first step to explain what you observe, right? So Antoine Lavoisier observed that the mass was the same before he burned something than after he burned something. And so he could come up with a hypothesis that there's something maybe inside of the, of the matter of the stuff that he's burning that doesn't burn up. Right. And, or, or nothing actually burns or, or you can just, there's a variety of different hypotheses. A good hypothesis is two different things. And this is important to know it's testable right? So we can go into the lab or we can, or we can test it using an experiment. And it's also falsifiable. A, a hypothesis needs to be falsifiable. If that's the case, can we ever prove a hypothesis or can we ever prove something in science? The answer to that question is no. And actually, in this class, it's a main theme in this class and future chemistry classes is that a good hypothesis is falsifiable and you cannot prove anything in science. Prove is actually a dirty word in my class. Now, we'll use it. I use it sometimes, just, just not thinking. Uh, and, and we'll catch each other on it, right? Oh, you said prove. And so we technically can't prove because it has to be falsifiable. So then a consistent set of observations is a law. A hypothesis is the first step in trying to explain that. Well, then what we do is we make a scientific theory. And, and this is the why it happens, right? Why did Antoine Lavoisier see the conservation of, of, of matter or, or of, mat, of, of matter, right? Theories are not educated guesses as, as, as what some books would say. Theories explain the scientific laws and makes predictions about how future experiments will occur and, and what will happen, right? It makes predictions. You know, the atomic theory... Uh, by John Dalton was proposed after uh, Lavoisier came up with the law of conservation of matter. And so, and, and we'll, we'll go into that in chapter two about the, the atomic theory and, and how that explains the why Lavoisier saw what he saw. Can you guys think of any other examples of more scientific theories? You know, I have the oxygen theory of combustion right? I have the quantum theory in physics. I have game theory in sociology. Uh, I have the theory of evolution in biology, right? And all these theories have the same purpose. They explain why something is the way it is. So hypothesis laws and theories are all tested through experimentation. We said this, that you have to be able to experiment the things that we learn 
our uh, the things that we learn um, or through the knowledge that we have is through empirical data, which is taken through experimentation. And so I have the picture here is the scientific approach. I, I kind of like this uh, picture a little bit because it's drawn in a circle. And that's the way the scientific method is, is it is circular in that you come up with a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis through experiments, it either confirms the hypothesis or confirms the law, or you have to revise your hypothesis or you have to revise the law. And then you test it some more. All these are based on observations, right? And you make observations through experimentation too. And then, you know, it can go into a theory or hypothesis can turn into a theory, which then is again, tested through experimentation that either confirms or revises it. Now, Experiments are highly controlled procedures designed to generate observations that confirm or refute a hypothesis. They're highly controlled. Why do you think, or what do you think it means when we say that an experiment is highly controlled? Why do you think we need controls? So we have controls so that we can make sure the data that we're seeing is what we think we see you know, when, when we get a negative result. So let's say we do an experiment and nothing shows up. Is that because we just didn't set up the experiment right? Or is that because that's actually what we should be seeing? And without controls, we can't tell that. So controls help solidify the data that we see. But, you know, I, I just said, or, or Dr. Bishop, but what if we have like three experiments that confirm a hypothesis or support a hypothesis? Then can we prove it? The answer to that question is no, we can never prove a hypothesis law or theory, right? Because we cannot test 100% of the different iterations, the different things within, within the hypothesis law or theory. So with regards to hypotheses, the simple hypothesis, the better. Um, whoops, I think there, there we go. The simple hypothesis, the, be the better. Uh, this is known as Occam's razor. I just throw this in here because a lot of times what we think of as science is, is just super complicated. And the reason why it's super complicated is because the professors, I'll throw myself in there, can really complicate it, right? And the way scientists talk about science uh, is, is sometimes in the most complicated fashions. And so we just need to simplify it. And that's what my goal in this course is, is, is to make it simple. Now, it is difficult. I'm not saying it's not, it's easy. Don't, don't confuse uh, difficult or, or easy with being simple. That, those two aren't the same. So it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to, it's difficult. This class will be difficult, but I'm going to try to make it simple, right? And show you just the simple things. And so um, that's about science. So we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna get into now a little bit more detail about matter, chemistry itself. And matter, we said chemistry says you matter. And that's awesome. Uh, matter occupies space and has mass. If you look around your room or wherever you're watching this video, you will see a bunch of stuff that has matter. The computer you're watching this on has matter. The chair you're sitting on has matter. The desk, maybe you have your computer sitting on has matter. You have matter, right? Because we occupy space and we have mass. Now mass is different than weight, right? Weight is the measure of a gravitational pull on you. Whereas mass is just the amount of substance that you have. Mass doesn't change if I were to sit here or sit on the moon. My weight would because of a different gravitational pull. So a specific instance of matter is known as a substance, right? It is known as a substance. One way to classify matter is based on its state. We, we all know uh, the states of matter um, solid, liquid, gas. I understand there's a couple others. We're not going to focus on those in this class, but we're just going to focus on solid, liquid, and gas. Solids can be either crystalline or amorphous. We're not going to really deal with those any, but just solid, liquid, and gas. And, and what we need to take note of, and what you might want to write down if you're taking notes, I hope you are, um, you, you need to take note of this. Solid has a fixed volume and a fixed shape right? Solid, solids have a fixed volume and a fixed shape. In, in here on my desk uh, where I'm currently sitting, I have a Rubik's cube. Rubik's cube is a solid. If I were to put this Rubik's cube into a cup, the solid doesn't change its shape and it doesn't change its volume. It's still like this. So that's solids. Liquids 
have a fixed volume. So here I have a Nalgene on my desk, right? And, and right now it has some liquid in it. And so the liquid goes up to whatever this level is. And so if I were to pour this into a different container, the volume stays the same. Now the shape would change depending on the container that I pour it into. So volume has a fixed, or, or liquids have a fixed volume, but no fixed shape. And we're gonna talk about gases later in the semester. Gases have neither a fixed volume or a fixed shape. So they have no fixed volume and no fixed shape, right? And so it's very important to know this because especially with a gas, since it has no fixed volume or fixed shape, it can be compressed, right? We can compress a gas into a smaller container. And, and like we have, you know, in, in hairspray and other containers. We have to be careful, obviously, because of high pressures uh, when they're around heat. But, but again, solids, fixed volume, fixed shape. Liquids, fixed volume, no fixed shape. Gases, no fixed volume, no fixed shape. Another way that we can classify matter is based on its composition, right? Based on some simple questions can determine if it if a compound, right? If something where we're talking about matter, if it's an element, if it is a compound, or if it is a mixture, right? So if a matter, is it a pure substance? So what do we mean by pure substance? Is there anything else in it, right? There's only one component and its composition is invariant. It's only that one component. So let's say we look at pure water, right? Pure water with nothing in it, right? That is a pure substance. There's only H2O in it. There's nothing else. Whereas a mixture is composed of two or more components and proportions that vary, right? Depending on which, what we're gonna talk about. So then what's an element, right? Because we said a mixture can be either pure or, or a matter can either be pure or a mixture. Well, let's look at the pure side first. The pure side, we have an element. So uh, what you will see, I don't have one here with me, but you will see a period, nice periodic table of elements. We'll look at it in the lab. Uh, on each exam, you'll be given one. Um, if you see something on that periodic table of an element that is the matter that we're looking at, that's going to be an element, right? It can't be broken down into anything simpler. Or if it's a compound, right? So, so we have to the farthest left, we have an element. Can't be separated. If it could be separated, then it's what's known as a compound. And a compound like pure water, right? Water can be broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. So then let's talk about the mixtures. There's two different types of mixtures. There's the heterogeneous mixture and there's a homogeneous mixture. Now, here's the, this one is gonna kinda, we're, we're gonna kinda have to think about this one a little bit. Homogeneous mixture has the same composition all the way throughout. So, I am right now drinking a cup of hot tea. If I were to look at that composition of the hot tea, they would be filled with water, and a little bit of the tea, the tea molecules floating around. That's it, all the way throughout, right? So it's the same composition. Now, let's say we look at a pepperoni pizza, right? And we, we open the box, you know, you just get it delivered. We open a box and we think, oh man, this looks good. If you've ever ordered a pepperoni pizza and you looked at the pepperoni, were there the same number of pepperonis on every slice? No. One slice got one, another slice got four, another slice got three, right? They're all different. That, that would not be a uniform composition. That would be a heterogeneous mixture. Another test for heterogeneous mixture is let's say we take a bowl of M&Ms. I love M&Ms. So let's say we take a bowl of M&Ms and we take one handful of M&Ms in each hand. So we, now we got two handfuls and I drop the handfuls and I count. Do you think the odds, what do you think the odds were of me getting the, the exact same two uh, numbers of M&Ms in all the same colors in these two sides, right? It'd be very, very low. And so that would be, again, a heterogeneous mixture. Again, if you guys have any questions, one, one of the things I wanna, obviously we have to do it this way. We have to do class lecture this way. Uh, it's not ideal, that's okay. Um, but if you guys have any questions as you're going through these, please ask me or please ask your classmates. Um, you know, we, we, we're here to help each other. So we have mixtures, right? We, we have these things that are composed of different things. Well, we might want to separate them. And this is what you're going to be doing in lab. Uh, one of the things that you're going to learn to do in lab, at least is the first and the last one. We're not really going to do the one in the middle here in Gen Chem, but you will in organic, uh, is the first way we can separate mixtures is decanting, right? You just carefully pour off a liquid into another container. 
The other one is distillation. So here, I think I have a picture. There's a filtration and decanting actually. Um, and cause you're going to decant the mixture into the filter. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use a filter paper to just catch all the solids and let the liquids uh, drip all through. Distillation is separating a liquid from a liquid um, and, and using the different boiling points. That's about all we need to know about how to separate mixtures. Um, here's another thing that we need to know. Um, changes that matter can undergo can either be considered physical or chemical. Now, on an exam, I just wanna let you guys know this. On an exam, it will be obvious whether I'm talking about a physical or a chemical change. It will be obvious. There will be no doubt on what, I, what I'm talking about. And so uh, physical changes alter only the state, right? Going from solid to liquid or liquid to gas or appearance, but not the composition, right? So when we melt an ice cube, water's in the ice cube, water's in the water, is in the liquid. It's water, we don't change the water. Whereas a chemical change alters the composition of the matter itself. Right. And, and especially with chemical changes, this is why I say it's going to be obvious with a chemical change. If you don't actually go into the lab to test it and to see if the chemical change has occurred, then you're not actually going to know uh, whether the chemical change uh, has occurred or not or whether it's a chemical change or not. And so uh, just as just here's some examples I want you guys to write down uh, one burning of a lamp oil. Burning of lamp oil. Bleaching hair with hydrogen peroxide, melting of ice cream, right? So burning of lamp oil, bleaching hair with hydrogen, melting of ice cream. If you would like to pause the video here, just so that you guys can answer those before I give you the answer, this would be the right time to do that. All right, here comes the answers for those. Burning of lamp oil is a chemical change. Now you might think, well, I thought it was just physical because we're turning the lamp oil into lamp gas. In a way, yes, but we're also burning it. So we're making a, something new. We're, we're breaking out the lamp oil. Bleaching hair with hydrogen peroxide is a chemical change because you're actually changing the composition of your hair. And then melting of ice cream, that one is physical because you're just taking something solid and turning it into liquid, but the ice cream is, is staying the same. All right, the last thing we're going to cover right now, and we're just going to do it in like one second because... We're gonna cover energy more in chapter six and we're gonna get more in depth in it. Uh, it's just the energy, right? We're gonna talk about energy in this class and that's just the capacity to do work, right? To do work. Uh, there's two types of energy. There's kinetic, which is energy associated with motion and potential, which is energy associated with a position or composition, right? Chemical energy, the food we eat has potential energy. Our body turns it into kinetic energy so that we can actually work. So this ends chapter one part one's lecture uh just going through just the basics uh the background um uh, of chemistry what is chemistry how to set the stage i'm gonna part two we'll start to cover some units and some dimensional analysis and how we might be able to better solve some of these problems and start looking at the patterns uh that we'll see